Happy Sabbath, everyone. So glad you're here, and if you're online, you're especially welcome. I want to begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, may the angels take what I'm about to say and adjust it as it needs to be adjusted, and then empower me to present it to be a blessing and an encouragement to everyone. Thank you. So Father, we are here in your presence and we pray that by your grace, we will respond to your love and to your invitation in Jesus' name. And thank you, amen. What happens when you pray? Over in England, in the early 1800s, there was a young teenager by the name of George Muller. George did not believe in religion, no. He smoked or he drank, he stole, he lied. One day, I don't know where, he, where the person was, but he noticed this man kneeling and praying. Now, the fellow who was doing the praying had no idea what was going to come as a result of his example. But George took one look at that. He said, oh, I need salvation. He knelt down beside his bed and he prayed. And I don't know how they got the words. Maybe he told someone. But he said, Lord, will you help me in my life Bless me wherever I go, and please forgive my sins. When he got off his knees, no more drinking, no more stealing, no more lying. Instant history. Isn't that neat? Well, what happened next? Well, George spent the rest of his life praying. So what happened with that? Well, one day, George noticed orphans. And he lay, they were everywhere. And nobody was doing anything about them. And he thought, somebody, uh, maybe I'm the somebody. And so he started in a ministry to orphans. And before he was done, he had built five orphanages that would hold about 3,000 children. Now, the five together in today's money would cost $171,416,396.29. Now, how do they get the 29 cents? Well, George kept meticulous records, so they know. Now, he was an ordinary person. He wasn't rich. So where did the money come from? His knees. His knees. That's where it came from. Now, the architect who designed those orphanages for him, he said, Mr. Mueller, would it be all right with you if I did my work gratis? And George said, of course. So he did. Well, George, in his lifetime, how many orphans do you think he took care of? 10,025 orphans. Wow, that's a lot of people. He uh, built 117 schools. And he educated 120,000 young scholars. How did he do it? How did he pay for it all? His knees. He prayed to God about everything. One of the things he did was support a fellow over in India that you may have heard of. His name was Hudson Taylor. And later, Hudson wrote this. 
The Lord not only gives as much as is absolutely necessary for his work, but he gives abundantly. Now, George knew all about that because of his knees. You know, he never asked a soul for a dime or a pence. <laughs> it's England. But he did ask the Lord, and he never left a debt, not even one. So what happens when you pray? What happened when George Mueller prayed? Well, one morning, everybody was in their place at breakfast table, and George offered a prayer, thanking the Lord for the food they were about to receive. You know what? What he didn't tell them was there was not a crumb in the kitchen. And he thanks the Lord for breakfast. He goes to the door. It's a local baker. He says, Brother Muller, I've got bread I don't know what to do with. May, can I give it to you? Everybody had plenty of bread that morning. And then, back to the door again. You know what had happened? The milkman's cart had just broken down in front of their door. Everybody had a great breakfast of bread and milk that day. Isn't that neat? And uh, one morning, he had been in his devotions with the Lord, and he got this idea. Lord, it would be wonderful if every one of the kids had a banana for breakfast. He gave thanks to the Lord for the food they were about to receive, and... He goes to the door again. This trucker is standing there and he looks at him, he says, Muller, where do you want your bananas? He says, well, I think we can help, well, you know, we can accept them. He says, well, I was taking them to the market, but some said, bring them here. So where do you want them? <laughs> well, what happens when you pray? Incredible things. Muller always told the Lord, about everything. Well, in the year 1834, he founded the, catch this, Scripture Knowledge Institute for Home and Abroad. And through that foundation, Bibles and New Testaments were distributed. 285,407 Bibles. Thank you, George, for your meticulous records. And New Testaments, 1,459,506. Where did the money come from? His knees. That's where. Later in life, George traveled a lot. In August of 1877, he was crossing the Atlantic in the Sardinian. He had to get to a meeting in Quebec. As he's riding along, suddenly the, the ship starts slowing down and he gets concerned. And he goes up to see the captain. He says, Captain Dutton, I have an appointment tomorrow afternoon in Quebec and we're not gonna make it at this speed. <clears throat> Brother Muller, why do you think I slowed the vessel? For safety. Have you looked outside? You can't see anything, the fog is so dense. George immediately goes to the chart room to pray. Not long after, here comes Captain Dutton, comes into the room and he kneels down. Now he was not a religious fellow, but he knelt down to start to pray and suddenly he hears Moeller say, uh, Captain, you don't need to pray. I don't, no, the fog's already gone. It is. They went up to the bridge, clear as a bell. And Muller kept his appointment. So, well, what happens when you pray? Well, when Muller prayed, kids got taken care of and fed, buildings got built, hundreds and thousands of Bibles and New Testaments got distributed. People received the word of God. Now, that's the first question. What happens when you pray? 
There is a second question. What happens when you don't pray? There's a story in the Old Testament all about that. It's in Joshua chapter 9. All right? Joshua chapter 9. But before we jump into the chapter, we're going to back up and take a quick look at what was preceding this incident. All right? Israel had gotten a new leader named Joshua. He and the armies of Israel had attacked and wiped out two kings, Sihon and Og. Aren't you glad you don't have that name, guys? Sounds like a caveman, Og, Og, Og. <laughs> anyway, he, uh, they had crossed the Jordan on dry ground, just like they had 40 years earlier, the Red Sea. They had seen the walls of Jericho crumble into rubble. They had attacked little Ai and been completely routed. Joshua comes back to camp, falls on his face before the Lord, and he just lays there. And God watches this long enough and finally says, Joshua, what are you laying there like that for? Get up. Oh, Lord God, he's saying, not getting up. Lord, we fled before our enemy. 36 of our soldiers were killed. What can I say? Joshua, get up. There is sin in the camp. There is? Yes. Somebody stole spoils from Jericho. And until you deal with that, you're not going to be able to stand against your enemies. So what does Joshua do? Takes care of it. And then they re-attack Ai, and what happened to that poor city? Wiped out. Well, then Joshua took them off to Mount Ebal and Gerizim, where they renewed the covenant. And while he was at it, he read all of Moses' law, which would explain to them exactly what to do with idolaters. No question. Well... Canaanite at that time, or Canaan at that time, was inhabited with a wild, woolly bunch of scary looking people. Here's the list Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites. They had heard all about Moses and Israel, and now Joshua and Israel and They'd gone across the Red Sea on dry ground and Pharaoh and his whole military had drowned on the bottom of the sea when the water came in, including all those chariots. Wow, well, and now AI, first Jericho, now AI wiped out. Can you see the kings with their heads together? We're next, they're headed our way. We're gonna get it. Let's do something, let's attack them. So, all that braggadocio was just to cover up something. They were scared witless. Remember what Rahab said to the spies? The Lord has given you this land and a great fear of you has fallen on us. All who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Everyone's courage has failed. Scared or not, Joshua 9 verse 2 says, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. Let's get them. Well, not all of them. There was one city that was part of the tribe of Hivites, one city that didn't join, Gibeon. And that's what this story in this chapter is all about. When they heard about Jericho and AI, AI, they had no question what was going to happen to them next. They're on their way. Look, if we don't some, do something, we're going to get wiped out. So they kept chewing on this, and suddenly somebody got a brilliant idea. And if I didn't know better, I'd say it came from the enemy. But anyhow, somebody said, hey, here's the idea. Let's march right into the center of their camp and beard Joshua in his death. Tell him, we want a treaty with you. We've heard all about your God and the things he's done. Make a treaty with us. 
And somebody says, well, you think you're going to get away with it? Oh, no, 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 there's more. Look, we're going to wear the oldest things we've got, right? The oldest things. And we're going to carry everything that's old and decrepit and ready, like it came off the bone pile, okay? And uh, the oldest clothes, those wineskins that should be tossed, and moldy, dry bread, that stuff your wife has tried to get you to throw away and you haven't yet. And we'll say this. This was all brand new and fresh when we left to come here and it all wore out. We came so long and such a far way. Please make a treaty with us. Well, talk about getting scammed, right? I got an email, this is years ago, I got an email one day from some place in Africa, and this lady said, my husband who was quite wealthy just passed. He has seven million US dollars, and I don't trust our bank here, and somebody referred me to you. If you'll send me your bank information, I'll put it on deposit in your account. Now, how does that sound? <laughs> Whoa, that sounds good. It was a scam. And that's what this was. It was a scam. Into the camp they come. Looking like beggars from the local dump. These guys, look at them. They're very suspicious. Sir. We are from a far country and we've been on the way here for many days. We've heard so much about your God. Won't you make a treaty with us? Now, let's back up a few days. Before Jericho fell, Joshua is out in the countryside one evening. What's he doing out there? I think he's praying. And uh, he's looking at the walls of Jericho. Ooh, and he's praying. And all of a sudden, this impressive looking man, a soldier, stands in front of him. And he puts his hand on the hilt of his sword. He says, are you for us or our enemies? And this man says, neither. I have come as captain of the Lord's hosts. And, what, and he said, you better take your sandals off because you're on holy ground. And he told him how to get rid of those walls, break them down. Well, I think Joshua usually did things like that. Do you? He was a religious man. He prayed a lot. If he had a problem, he'd go to God about it. Kind of like Muller patterned after him. Well, anyhow, back to the beggars. Israel smells a rat. Joshua had taken them to mountains, Ebal and Gerizim. They renewed the covenant and so on. Notice verse 14. I read the first half, first time. This is the most significant verse in the entire book of Joshua. It says, the men of Israel sampled their provisions. Huh? Are you serious? They tried eating that dry moldy bread? Yuck. No, I don't think they tried to eat it, but I think they examined it just to make sure it was, you know, the real thing, which it was. And let's read this again. The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord, but did not inquire of the Lord. My question again is, what happens when you don't pray? They were scammed. They were scammed. Now, 
There are times in your life when you have been reduced to tears, right? You couldn't help it. The tears just came. This is one of those times, as I read this and think about it, that I believe tears came to God's eyes. Those people, he loved them so much. He cared so deeply. And he was ready with wise counsel to guide them in dealing with this Gibeonite bunch. But they cut him out. They never turned him, they never asked. Joshua never turned him and said, God, you know, what he could have done. <clears throat> Men from a far country, we don't know you. Therefore, we don't trust you. We don't know if you're telling us the truth or not. But if you look over there, see that big tent? That is where our God is residing. And we are going to leave you here. We're going to go over. He knows the truth. And we're going to ask him counsel. How should we respond to your request? And it will come back and tell you. Would God have been able to tell him what to do? Of course. But they didn't do that. Joshua never even thought of it. What carried the day? Dry, moldy bread. Ugh. And then they make the treaty, and what else did they do with it? They ratified it with an oath, which put them in a spot where they couldn't do anything different, anything. Three days later, they discovered the truth. What happened to Joshua at that point? I think his life crashed down around him. And with head bowed, he slowly trudged his way to the sanctuary and again fell on his face before the Lord. Oh, Lord God, what can I say? We cut you out, you of all beings, all gods. And he must have reiterated to the Father all the things that he had experienced, he had seen, that he knew. And then recited once again the terrible thing he had done to God. God could have looked at him and said, Joshua, don't you care about me? Don't you even care? How could you not even think of me? I was ready. I don't think God said that to him. That would have maybe rubbed his nose in it a little too much. But I'm sure God's heart ached to the very depths of his soul. Well, Again, this verse is the most significant verse in the entire book of Joshua. They did not inquire of the Lord. You ever do that? I mean, you ever not do that? You ever got a problem, you don't know what to do, and you don't even think of God? After how much he loves you, how can we do that to him? Oh my. James 4, verse 2. By the way, there is no record in Scripture where Joshua ever did that again. He always sought the Lord. James 4, 2 says, You do not have because you do not ask God. I better read that one more time, James 4, 2. You do not have because you do not ask God. And there is a classic from the book, Great Controversy, which I know you know it. It's from page 525. You, it is a, pardon me, it is a part of God's plan 
to grant us in answer to the prayer of faith that which he would not bestow did we not thus ask. Want to hear that again? Okay. It is a part of God's plan to grant us an answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow, did we not thus ask? Can you tell the invitation from the Lord in those words? Come to me. Tell me what's on your heart. Tell me what you need or what you want. What you're seeking from me. I'm listening. Oh, what, what a heartache. What a heartache. What are we missing out on when we don't pray more? Now, one more question. If you decide you're too busy not to pray, Martin Luther founder of the Lutheran Church. What a man. One day he said, ah, oh, I'm so busy. I've got so much to do. I'm going to have to spend three hours in prayer today. Two other comments. One, our former Lake Union Conference president, Elder Don Lissay, when he was here serving, never once did they have a meeting that they didn't start with one hour of prayer. When I was here in college, my undergrad religion department chair, Dr. Wilbur Alexander, one day in class, and I still remember this, he said, these churches, the way they do church, hmm, they start with a word of prayer, then go to committee. You know, if they started with a word of committee and then went to prayer, I think they'd get more accomplished. You think so? I know so. I know so. Somebody said, beware the barrenness of a busy life. Are you too busy not to pray? Now, if you decide to respond to the invitation that God gives us things in answer to the prayer of faith that he doesn't if we don't ask, how will you change your schedule? How many more hours will you spend with him each day than you have been? He's eager to hear your response in your thoughts and heart to that question. You know, the most powerful evangelist I ever met, that I ever worked under, and what a privilege it was, was Elder E.E. E. Cleveland. I was talking with Dr. Calvin Rock one time, and he, he came, uh, Elder Cleveland came up and he said, brother, we're all little Clevelands. Well, in 1972 in January, during the cold snap of the winter, at the pastor conference pastors meeting, he was guest speaker. And that night he spoke on the spirit of Mission 72, and I'll never forget it. He talked about his prayer life. He said, if I didn't, it wouldn't happen, but I set the alarm and I wake up at 12 o'clock midnight. He said, I'm no dummy, I put a pillow down. He said, I kneel and I pray for an hour. And then I go back to bed at one o'clock. And then he said this, little prayer, little power, much prayer, much power. He talked about going to Australia, first time. He, he was on that jet flight 23 hours from England, straight through to Australia, Australia, straight through to Australia. And when he got there, the first person they threw him at was the governor. Would you be a little apprehensive of meeting the governor of another country? Well, Elder Cleveland put it this way. 
I talked with a king for 23 hours. And when you've been talking to the king, you don't need to worry about the governor. The king will take care of him. People, you know what? It's time we started talking to the king. Now, if you want to react, interact with this, go online, 269-281-2345, and you just text the term Joshua 4, okay? And you'll be responded to, and maybe this will help you into a richer, fuller prayer life. It is time we spoke with a king.